Hi, I'm here today at Norwich Cathedral with Rob Whitworth, an established time-lapse photographer. You may know him from uh, his flow motion video of Dubai or his stuff that he's done with Planet Earth. And we're here today just to have a little interview and find out a bit about Rob. So firstly, who are you and what do you do? Uh, my name is Rob Whitworth. I'm a, I call it flow motion, but it's sort of like hyperlapse, time-lapse, experimental filmmaker. Um, and yeah, I've become known for several initially viral videos and then working in TV and, and more kind of established media. So what initially attracted you to time-lapse and hyperlapse as a medium? Uh, fun, really. I mean, it's, um, it's a less constricted area for me. I mean, I, I graduated and I went into... I graduated at the art college here in mm -hmm. Norwich and uh, had an advertising editorial degree, whatever that meant, okay. and sort of went into architectural photography. Um, and time lapse was always more of a hobby. It was always something that um, I kind of did for fun. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, from the very earliest stages of photography, I, I liked playing around with what the, you know, the camera reveals, this unseen world. Um, you know, even in black and white, shooting still life sets of, of decomposition, you know, of fruits rotting and things like that. It's just a way of, of um, a very playful way of using a camera. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, it, it grew from there into you know, a moment where I decided that rather than pursue architectural photography, I thought, why not do the thing that I love and I really enjoy and really have a go at that. And, and then, yeah, just continue to be as experimental as possible and, and see if people like it, really. Mm. So obviously, you had this interest in hyperlapse and time-lapse. What then did you do to take that from just to personal interest and something that you enjoy doing into paid work from clients? I work for free. <laughs> um, so I did, uh, like my very first Time Lapse High Plus project was actually quite near his for Latitude Music Festival. Okay, and yeah. I did that for some tickets, which was like the most amazing <laughs> thing in the world. Uh, and I got some backstage passes, you know, so that was like, you know, career high back yeah. then. Um, but I mean, the, the biggest moment was, um, in 2010, the end of 2010, I moved to Vietnam. Um, and that then gave me a period of time to, to get good, to refine what I was doing. Because um, I was in a sort of typical process where what I was doing I thought was amazing. <laughs> and people were like, yeah, that's all right. <laughs> and um, I think there's a lot of pressure present day on social media to constantly be sharing what you're mm -hmm. doing. But I think sometimes you need you know, to actually spend a bit more time away from, from sort of like um, kind of public exposure in a way and showing a work to actually kind of really think and really kind of refine it yourself. But anyway, I, I had a year uh, of just shooting and working out, you know, areas to explore yeah. and getting better and just learning the craft and all of those things. And um, that in Vietnam then led to the first video that I launched in December 2011, mm -hmm. which was shot in Ho Chi Minh City. It was a completely speculative uh, project and that put on Vimeo and got a million plays in, wow. in like three days, which was, you know, that sort of said, really there's cool. something good, yeah. <laughs> there's something <laughs> worth pursuing here. Um, so then I sort of ha I'd done my own thing with this first video and that then meant I did a couple more speculative works in uh, Kuala Lumpur and Shanghai. Um, and then it sort of, you know, I had my own portfolio, my own style, and then clients started to come to me saying, we want this, we want what you've done with these cities, rather than what I think a lot of people find is, you know, clients will ask, we want to make this, and we've got this in mind, and this in mind, and you've sort of, whereas I sort of had a very signature style right from then. Yeah. Okay, cool. And how much planning goes into one of the Hyperlapse videos that you create? Because to me, they seem, they seem so polished, and like you've planned every moment, but then at times, uh, I think of one video that I saw where somebody was walking and then somebody cycled past and then you tracked and followed oh, their yeah, movement, yeah. Yeah. and to me, that, did, that didn't seem like something you could have planned. Um, well, that was in North Korea. Mm. Uh, so, depending on what you believe about that video, no, um, that was filmed in a very short space of time. Uh, yeah. That would be like four days to wow. film the entire video. So that was exactly, I mean, there were a lot of people on bicycles. And so we, I think we had some people we'd asked to walk. I think they were in traditional dress. We happened to bump into them. We asked them, excuse me, can you walk along here? Mm -hmm. And then we had planned that there'd likely be a cyclist. So I think the guy I was shooting with, JT Singh, he was um, like, you know, trying to spot a good time. So yes, mm. and then I think that shot goes to a car. And yeah, I mean, obviously we weren't, I didn't know who the cyclist was or the car driver, and that yeah. was sort of uh, worked out. But I mean, 
that's not a typical shoot, um, a normal shoot, yeah. I mean, my style is flow motion, so the idea is it's a single take, so um, one scene seamlessly leads into another, uh, and therefore it needs to be pre-planned as much as possible yeah. to make the transitions work. So uh, on all the shoots I do nowadays, I will, generally there's a client involved, and I will create a storyboard, um, which then the client agrees mm -hmm. and approves. And um, yeah, then it's a matter of, it becomes a logistical exercise realizing those shots. So it's very heavily planned. And, and yeah. largely what I realize is the storyboard, you know, uh, deviations usually come the client might want some subtle changes, but, but yeah, it's, it's very much. And then you have talent and you have everything sort of as controlled as possible to create that shot. Mm. So then how long does it take for you to storyboard something like that? that? A video that might only be three or four minutes long, how, like, it must it's, take such it's a... It's a funny thing. Yeah, I mean, so even just to talk through a storyboard, like uh, there's a project I'm doing uh, next month in, in Sharjah, in uh, the United Arab Emirates, and um, yeah, to talk through the storyboard takes about five minutes, and the actual film's gonna be about two minutes 20, two minutes 30, <laughs> so it's like, you know. Um, it's, it's the biggest part of the project, as it were, because it's where all the creativity has to happen. And um, because then largely, once the storyboard's signed off, you're, it becomes very logistical. You're just realizing those shots, and then you're doing the post-production, which is creative, but it's, you know, you're still realizing the initial concept. So yeah, it's, it's the bit I find hardest, the storyboarding, mm -hmm. um, and kind of procrastinate the most over. Um, and it's the stage that the more time you spend on it, the better the outcome. You know, the pre-production stage is always the bit. The more effort you put into, the more kind of details and questions you iron out, and the more things you arrange in advance, the better everything goes. Mm -hmm. But I don't think I've ever spent long enough on that stage, but, <laughs> you know. Okay, and then, so obviously you worked on Planet Earth, mm -hmm. which uh, to, to me and to I think a lot of people interested in this kind of world is, it's like the mecca of filmmaking, yeah. right? It's as good, standard, it's yeah. as good as it can possibly get. And how did, that, how did that come about? Did that work any, it must have worked differently to I imagine a project that you did, would normally do? Yeah, yeah, I mean, they've got the, so that, that was a very long process actually. The initial, um, the, the, the series, the episode I worked on particularly, like most work was used in is called Cities and Planet Earth 2. Mm -hmm. So the producer of that episode approached me, um, you know, like 2013, 2012, yep. I think. Um, and then we, you know, the conversations grew and then he came up to Shanghai and we did some test shooting. And then um, I was living in Shanghai at the time. And yeah, and then it sort of um, came together with some actual formal shoots that were on. But yep. yes, it's sort of, they have their own process working with the BBC. It's, it's a huge organization. So there's a lot of, um, oversight, different people need to approve different stages, and you're never entirely sure if what you filmed is actually gonna make it into the final <laughs> episode. Um, but all along, you know, exactly the same as you, like, you know, watching Planet Earth stuff, David Attenborough stuff as a kid, natural, uh, the Natural History Unit stuff, it's just, it's always been the gold standard, the sort of yeah. like, wow, you know, mm -hmm. and just the very idea of being involved in it was, you know, it still is kind of unbelievable. Um, and then having David Attenborough, you know, his voice over the final sequences. It's amazing. It's, yeah, it's, it's still like, it's one of the, you know, career highlights. I think that would be difficult to top that, so yeah. Definitely. So kit, what kind of, do, do you float around and use lots of different bits of kit or is there a particular camera or a particular lens series that you stick to religiously? So yes, I mean, naturally, uh, I have my own kit, so I've invested in, uh, Nikon is sort of the brand I use. Okay. And, my cameras are Nikon cameras, and it's, it's a, uh, you know, something I review. I wouldn't be reluctant to change if there was a reason to, mm -hmm. but it has to be quite a strong reason. But equally, uh, on some shoots, the client provides the kit, so you use their kit, and you know, it doesn't, at the end of the day, they're all very high-end bits of equipment. But um, yeah, my current kit is um, a mixture of uh, some DSLRs and yeah. the, the new mirrorless. I've got a Z7, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, you know, is, is yeah, they're, they're amazing cameras. Well, and I love- really good. You know, for me, it's about you know using new technology and being as experimental as possible, um, and then you know maximizing post-production and shooting. So, so being on the forefront of the, the cameras and what the sensors can do, and and all of those things opens up creative possibilities. You can do things that previously weren't possible, and that's you know that's what I find exciting mm. to to kind of explore. And then, so you mentioned post-production. How much post-production <laughs> must go into these videos? Are you are you 
you know, cropping every shot, or are you, is it sort of just you, you use it as it comes out of camera? It's just there's an auto button in Photoshop. Yeah, I know. You, just, you just press that. <laughs> And then lot. you send it to the client. And then, yeah. <laughs> then they send it back. No. It's, it's a lot of post-production. I mean, yeah. but it's um, the, the way it's kind of, you know, like high plaps is a good example. It's a well-known technique. But, you know, if you sent the client what you shot in camera, you know, you wouldn't hear from them again. Yes. <laughs> or you might do for their lawyers. Um, <laughs> so it's very much you're shooting for post-production. And it's, it's yeah. you know, for me, it's about, you know, when I'm planning a project, I'm working out you know, what I'm going to do in post-production and what I'm going to do in camera to maximize all those stages. Um, but post-production is, is an area I love and it's, it's an absolutely key stage. And to answer your initial question, it's, it's about, it's usually more than half. So if I spend a day shooting, it's one to two days post. Okay, well, it's not as long as I actually thought it would be. It, but it's, there's no, you know, there's some bits that are quicker than others. So some yeah. sequences are, you know, literally, I've spent, you know, so like, there's a nice example, the Hong Kong sequence in Planet Earth yeah. 2, there's a bit where we power down Hong Kong, because it's like the journey of yes, life. Yes, yes. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, that would have taken three or four days for like six seconds, something like that. I mean, <laughs> but it's fun, you know, the more you can really, you know, really focus in and, you know, the minute details of maximizing everything. And I kind of like that, the, you know, the sort of control and, you know, play and freedom you have in post-production to sort of maximize mm -hmm. the concept. And then what, what would your typical post-production workflow be? Would you, you know, do you, I assume you shoot on the raw files, yep. and then do you, what, what do you use to grade those raw files, and then what, what editing software do you use? So there's um, for time-lapses, and hyperlapse is a go-to bit of software called LR time-lapse okay. um, by a guy named Gunther Wagner, who I, uh, who's a great guy, and he's, he is a time-lapse himself, and it's just, a, you know, it is, the perfect bit of software designed by somebody who knows the industry and knows the requirements. Yep. And it's one of the few bits of software when you get an update, it's like, good, because it'll make it better. It's not yes. like, ah, <laughs> what have they done? Um, Three more error codes. So yeah, okay. just things don't work <laughs> and things are slower and, you know, just a, a day of rage ensues. But um, yeah, so, so the first stage is shoot raw, uh, mm -hmm. import, use LR time lapse. What that lets you do is, the, you know, one of the go-to things in time lapse is the holy grail, which is shooting day to night. And you know, during that, the exposure will shift massively, um, the white balance will shift massively, and a number of other parameters. Mm. So, so what that software allows you to do is make that absolutely smooth as anything, and, and do the transitions, uh, you know, exactly as you want them. And that works in conjunction with uh, Lightroom, Adobe okay. Lightroom. Uh, so the grading is actually done in Lightroom, but LR time lapse helps smooth, you know, transitions from frame one to frame twenty-five. Um, and it also, LR time lapse also fixes flicker, which is another big issue for time lapse, mm -hmm. um, which, you know, you pretty much, you'll always get it a little bit, and depending on, you know, luck of the draw, sometimes you get a lot, sometimes you don't. It's, uh, it's a very hard one to, you know, remove entirely, and frankly, there's no need to, because you can remove it in post. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then, so once I've graded in, in uh, Lightroom, I then do uh, the actual assembly work in Adobe After Effects. Yeah. So that's where I actually put all the different bits together and, and assemble mm -hmm. the, you know, uh, the, the actual sequences um, and the final output from After Effects. You must have a pretty powerful uh, PC to be dealing with all of those files within um, After Effects. Well, so I'm, I'm a Mac user, um, and I've just got the new 16-inch Mac, yep. you know, like ridiculously expensive machine, and After Effects won't stream for UHD ProRes. Like, it won't play it. <laughs> so I just, like, it's uh, the two things. I probably should be a PC user to use After Effects, but, you know, I'm not. So, so yes, I have the most expensive computer I can buy, and I still hate it, and like <laughs> spend a lot of time staring at progress bars and desperately trying to work out a way of making it faster, but not found it yet. 